Um, <clears throat> I'm originally from, uh, from France. Um, you may tell by my uh, accent, which I stopped trying to get rid of. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Um, and um, I have a doctorate in uh, uh, French Renaissance literature, and I began my career as a teaching college. Um, and I, uh, my PhD is uh, already almost 20 years old. That was in 2001. Um, and so I uh, began my career as a, as a professor, uh, but um, a few years into it, my first wife died of cancer. and. Uh, didn't uh, recover from that for a while, and um, that coincided with, um, I was up for tenure soon after that, and I didn't get tenure. I had fallen behind in my, um, in my research, and uh, so my college years were uh, over at that point. So then I, I joined, a, I taught at the University of South Alabama for seven years, um, and then in Mobile, Alabama, I uh, was hired by uh, a private school, a private high school there, um, which was great. Um, and I taught there uh, six or seven years, I don't remember. Um, I taught French, um, but also I started the Latin program there. Uh, and it was, um, it, was, uh, it was very nice. Um, I enjoyed it very much, but then I found out about the classical Christian schools and I said, I, I want to be part of that. Uh, this is really what I want for me, for my children. Uh, I want to grow up um, uh, and going through these, uh, these schools as, uh, as students. Um, so I started at Regent two, two years ago, um, and uh, I've been teaching the literature class for the juniors, so it's a Euro European literature class. Um, I have two sections of that, and um, ninth grade and 10th ten grade Latin. Um, um, and so I was pleased to see uh, that on the curriculum of uh, the literature classes, one of the authors was Erasmus. Um, and uh, The Praise of Folly was the book that we read with, uh, with our students. Um, Erasmus was a student, um, um, an author that I had studied uh, for my research uh, when I was working on my dissertation. I really enjoyed him very much, um, but since uh, I stopped teaching college. I haven't um, kept up with, with all this research. And, um, um, but so I was, I was happy to have the opportunity of uh, revisiting The Praise of Folly um, uh, again. Um, and so I, I've been teaching it the last two years. And this presentation about The Praise of Folly by Erasmus is the fruit of a reflection on how to teach this challenging book to 11th graders. After teaching the book for two years in a row um, and not being totally satisfied with the results, I said to myself, how can you make it more accessible to the students? What is it that you need to make really clear to, to them? What is it that you really want them to take away from this book? In response to these questions, I've, I have come up with a list of six things that I think are really essential. So here's the... Um, the idea that um, we, we have a book and we know it well, um, but how, how do we, how, what, what do we need to do in order to extract from it everything that, that the students should understand? How do we um, extract all the wealth, all the treasures that are found uh, in the books that we read, and of course, all the books that we read uh, are classics. So, I mean, they, they all have a lot of value. There is there's great treasure there. And so I, I, I'm, I'm constantly thinking, okay, um, how can I make this, how, how do I make the students understand the importance of this book and what is Erasmus is, is uh, really saying here? So first I want my students to, to understand clearly who Erasmus was. So we, we go over his life, and I want particularly to insist on the education he received. So my six points, uh, I have six points, and this will be the first one. So point number one, the life of Erasmus. He was born in 1469, and he died in 1536. So 
who was Erasmus? He was a Christian, um, and he was a humanist. He went to a school led by the Brothers of the Common Life, um, a group founded by a man named Gerard Grutter. That was in the Netherlands. And there he received a, a Christian education. And he was exposed as well to Greco-Roman literature. Erasmus was also exposed to the modern devotion, the devotio moderna, the spiritual ideal, ideal lived and, thought, and taught in the Netherlands from the beginning of the 14th century by this man, Gerard Grutter. And the modern devotion emphasized personal piety, practical Christian living, humility, charity, and it had a distrust of all that glitters, even of knowledge that does not lead towards God. It was kind of austere, but it influenced Erasmus. Thomas A. Kempis, the author of The Imitation of Christ, and Nicholas of Cusa, who wrote On Learned Ignorance, the De Docta Ignorantia, <laughs> had um, also been <coughs> students at that school in, uh, in Daventer before Erasmus. Erasmus then went on to study in a monastery where he remained for five or six years and where he found many, many good books where he began writing and developed his style in, uh, in Latin. He read the books of the church fathers and the classical books in the great library of the monastery. It must have been wonderful. He went on to travel all over the world and wrote many, many books. So this was Erasmus, the author of The Praise of Folly. The next thing I want my students to understand is the genre to which uh, The Praise of Folly belongs. So I want to make, to make it clear to them that it is a mock encomium. It is an encomium, but it's a mock encomium. And so again here, it's the idea that, and I, I find this, I'm, I'm learning this little by little, that I think the students are understanding what's going on, but they are not necessarily. So it is my responsibility to make sure that they get it, because they're only 11th graders, they, they have a certain maturity yet, but they're not quite mature yet, and uh, they have a lot of other things going on when they come to my class. They are thinking about um, the other uh, subject uh, that they had before, the, the, the following subject. So we need to get into the book, um, and, and so they need to focus on that. Um, but again, there are so many, they have all these activities and so many other things going on. So I want to slow down and make sure that um, I, I'm, I am clear um, and I explain clearly to them what is going on. So what is a mock encomium? So point number two, the, monk en the mock encomium. The mock encomium is a, is a paradoxical praise that in involves the praise of unworthy, unexpected, or trifling objects, such as the praise of lying, the praise of debts, the praise of gout, the praise of boldness, the praise of folly. So it is the praise of something that is not normally praised. So the whole book is based on a paradox. The book Encomium follows the form of a regular panegyric. In his uh, Institutio Oratoria, Quintilian had set forth the topoi uh, for different kinds of praises. In the praise of gods, for example, one will express the general veneration about this god, the special powers of this god, the benefits he, or if it's a goddess, she has brought to mankind his exploits 
uh, and his genea genealogical descent. And this is exactly what Foley does in The Praise of Foley. She gives her geneal genealogy and tells the benefits she has brought to mankind. Probably the most um, influential mock encomium um, that Erasmus read, and um, even today, um, um, it, its fortune was, was tremendous, was the Laus Muscae, the praise of the fly, written by uh, Lucian of Samosata in the second century AD. It's a fairly short uh, document, five or six pages long. And Lucian of Saponsetta was one of the favorite authors of, uh, of Erasmus. Um, and so Erasmus, of course, as a humanist, um, knew him really well. And after reading The Praise of the Fly, one is led to conclude that indeed this little creature normally repulsive, is a wonderful little bug after all. <laughs> By the same token, in the praise of folly, Erasmus is telling us that folly is not as foolish as one might believe, and we would do well to lend her our ears. The fool indeed is no fool at all. Point, point number three, satire. I want my students to um, really understand that what is happening in this book is uh, really a satire of uh, uh, 16th century Europe. Um, uh, Erasmus is criticizing some people in particular. And so I want them to understand that he, uh, the genre of satire uh, has, a, has a history also, just like the mock encomium. Uh, Erasmus did not invent it. There's a tradition of sat sat satiric uh, literature. And so then Erasmus is more of an imitator uh, than, than a creator here. So I want to study this history somewhat with, uh, with my students. Or maybe depending on the class and um, depending on the year, um, I may ask the students to do some research as well on who were the, the satirical writers of, uh, of the past. So which authors uh, used satire in, uh, in antiquity? The big names associated with, uh, with satire are Juvenal, Perseus and Horace, and satire comes from the Romans. It was not invented by the Greeks. Yeah. <clears throat> Quintilian said rightly, satura quidem tota, tota nostra est. Satire, indeed, is entirely ours. So what do the satirists have in common? The satirist cannot remain quiet. He is angry. Juvenal famously wrote, Facit indignatio versum. My indignation makes my verse. It's because I am upset that I write. The satirist must say what he feels. He feels provoked by the world by human occupations and the corruption of the world. And he has to speak against the customs and the character of his contemporaries. Aggressivity, polemic, indignation, irony, mocking fill his discourse as he denounces the loss of virtue or good practices and calls for a return to better days. Again, Juvenal spoke loud and clear when he said, Difficile es saturam non scribere. 
difficult to not to write satire. Horace said that in his satires, Lucilius, who was considered one of the first satirists, sale multu urbem de frequit. He rubbed the city down with much salt. Mm. Oh, that must have hurt. Can you imagine that? <clears throat> Satire speaks truth. It pursues the good. It seeks virtue. Satire is an instrument for moral reform. It denounces vices in the hope of a change of behavior for the benefit of humanity. The stakes are huge indeed. Those in position of power are to be watched carefully because they can do much for better or for worse. Juvenal had warned about this in his satire number six by asking the question, quis custodiet ipsos custodes? Who will guard the guardians themselves? So what did the satirists see their contemporaries do? They saw <coughs> men and women obsessed with power and being corrupted by power. They saw people willing to do anything to acquire wealth, praying for wealth above anything else, hunting for legacies, taking pride in the name of their family while being unworthy of that name themselves. They saw many discontented with their lot and envious of others. They saw much hypocrisy going around and they asked, do these people practice what they preach? They saw many pursuing a life of luxury and ruining themselves just to impress others. In short, they were exhibiting the follies of humanity. The world has gone crazy, they said. Look at what people do. This sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> you look around, um, some things never change, it, it seems. So here is Erasmus, walking in the footsteps of these writers and inspired by them to denounce the behaviors of his contemporaries. Not all, mind you. Folly has a good laugh when she denounces her effects on people on a daily basis. When she shows us our foolishness, for which she takes credit, People wanting to get married, for example, given the difficulties of marriage. <laughs> Our silly little habits, passions, hobbies, obsessions. She claims credit for the funny grandpa who makes everybody laugh at a family gathering. And for the man who is the life of the party. A little folly does not hurt. It makes life enjoyable, more bearable even. In fact, folly inspires heroes. It drives courage and industry and human imagination that will birth the greatest inventions and lead men to great deeds. And the readers understand that. Folly makes sense. When Erasmus, like Juvenal, Perseus, and Horace, attacks his contemporaries, he does not attack the behaviors I have just described. To err is human, to laugh is human. And there is nothing wrong with that. But something is very wrong when the guardians themselves are corrupt and are leading society to its own perdition. So who does Erasmus attack? 
He attacks the church leaders, the kings and the princes, the theologians who are not doing what they are supposed to do. These are his victims. Erasmus sought to change society. This was the humanist and the Christian in him. And this is what I want to stress next with my students. So point number four, Erasmus the humanist. <clears throat> Again, so this is the idea here that I, I, I want to understand where in the 16th century this is uh, right, so the century of humanism um, and Christian hu humanism in the, say so, in the case of Erasmus. And it's very important that they understand <coughs> what was going on at that point. So in my class then when I teach this book, for example, I see it as um, a complement to what may, they may have seen in the history class, for example, with one of my colleagues. Um, but then I see my role as, okay, I, I want to help them connect the dots, right? So here is a 16th century writer. This is what you learn in history about 16th century Europe. And now we see that happening in this book. And um, so if I uh, manage to connect these dots for them, if I, if, I, if I see that happening, then I think I have, I have done my part of my job anyway. If, if it creates a light, if something um, happens uh, there, um, then that's, that's great. That's, that's what I want to do. Um, I want them to understand where the book is coming from and what we have there and w what is the thinking behind it. Oh, here's one. Is this yours or mine? I don't remember. Oh, oh, I think my bottle is here. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <clears throat> So Erasmus was the author of his famous book, The Adages, a collection of popular sayings, epigrams, proverbs, and anecdotes, a book that contained the wisdom of the ages. The first edition was published in 1500 with 818 adages. The last edition appeared in 1536 with 4,151 adages. And this, they are available, all of them, in three or four volumes, I think, uh, uh, at the University of Toronto, um, which has the complete edition of Erasmus' book um, in Latin and in English translation. But that's, to my knowledge, that's one of the, or maybe there's another one, of the complete edition of the Adages. Moral instruction was at the heart of his work, um, on which Erasmus worked uh, his entire life. Whoever observed the wise saying of the ancients of, of scripture and of the church fathers would be led to a virtuous life in imitation of Christ. The praise of folly is filled with classical references. And I don't want my students to miss that. As a Christian humanist, Erasmus wanted to reconcile Christianity and antiquity without confusing them. Learning had to support piety and true piety must lead to moral actions. The classics showed man's vices and emphasized the pursuit of virtues. And so study in the classics helped to attain moral perfection. So what are some examples of uh, wisdom in the praise of folly? I will mention a famous one that is the, the reference to the Silene of Alcibiades. In this particular passage of uh, the praise of folly, folly explains that life affairs are like Silene. Folly says, you would better look twice at things because appearances are deceptive. She's giving us a caution, an invitation to prudence. So who were the Sileni? In the adages, 
Erasmus de decribes, describes them thus. The Sileni are said to have been a kind of small figure of carved wood, so made that they could be divided and opened. Thus, though when closed they looked like a caricature of a hideous flute player, went opened, they suddenly displayed a deity, so that this humorous surprise made the carver's skill all the more admirable. Socrates was the perfect Silenus, Erasmus writes. And this is his description. This description of Socrates. With his peasant face, <laughs> glaring like a bull, and his snub nose always sniffling, he might have been taken for some block-headed country bumpkin. <laughs> Erasmus will make you laugh like that. Uh, all of a sudden you read something very serious and then there's that hilarious <laughs> sentence. That's great. Um, the care of his person was neglected his language simple and homely and smacking of common folk. Yet, had you opened this absurd Silenus, you would have found, you may be sure, a divine being. Rather than a man, a great and lofty spirit, worthy of a true philosopher, one who despised all the things for which other mortals run their races, sail the seas, toil, go to law, and fight in wars. End of uh, quote. But of course, Erasmus continues, the greatest of all the Sileni was Christ. He was a marvelous Silenus our Lord and Savior, an example for all Christians to imitate. Erasmus writes that he was, quote, of parents <coughs> of modest means and lowly station and a humble home, poor himself and with few and poor disciples, recruited not from noble's man, noble man's palaces, or the chief sects of the Pharisees, or the lecture rooms of philosophers, but from the publican's office and the nets of fishermen. And then his way of life. What a stranger he was to all physical comforts as he pursued through hunger and weariness, through insults and mockery, the way that led to the cross. This Silenus was God himself. Other Sileni were the prophets, John the Baptist, the apostles. They represented humility. They were the opposite of everything that was showy, glittering, self-satisfied. And yet, they changed the world. How different they were. Erasmus goes on, so uh, the, uh, uh, the ad adage on the Sileni um, of Asibiades is very long. It's in the edition I have at home, and it's a, an abbreviated edition, I believe it's about 50 pages long. It's one of the longest. <clears throat> Erasmus goes on to condemn bad theologians and philosophers, bad kings and princes, bad priests and bishops, whom he calls Sileni inside out. They look very impressive on the outside, but they are really bad inside. With such people and in such a world, quote, Gold is more valued than sound learning. Ancient lineage 
more than integrity. Bodily endowments more than intellectual gifts. True religion takes second place to ceremonies. Christ's commandments to the decrees of men. The mask to the true face. Shadow is preferred to substance. Artificial to natural. Transient to solid. Momentary to eternal. Follows a long condemnation of the church which we find almost in similar terms in the praise of folly. Erasmus repeated himself a lot. <laughs> we read uh, over and over again um, m many, many things. He, he had his favorite uh, themes uh, to which he always came back. He kept emphasizing the necessity for the church to reform itself, to change its practices, just like men needed to amend their lives, so did the church have to do better, thought Erasmus. Kings, popes, cardinals, bishops have a huge influence on populations. Are they going to be good shepherds? Or are they going to be wolves or tyrants and corrupt leaders for their own people, leading them astray and then causing great suffering. Great examples of wisdoms were to be found in the classics and in the Bible. This is the message uh, of Erasmus as a Christian humanist. He found his references in both. They were his sources of wisdom and framed his worldview. He found the truth both in the scriptures and in the ancient writers. And again, the, I, I want my students to understand that, uh, the, this double influence, to, to really understand who um, Erasmus was as a, as a Christian humanist. Hence, all the references to classical texts, authors, characters, mythology, and all the sayings and proverbs that can be unsettling to our students who are not familiar or as familiar with them as Erasmus was. So here we are, right, in 2020, uh, the book was uh, published in 1511, so what is that, 500 years later? Okay, so how can a 21st century student relate to a book that was written 500 years with references and uh, that are not the ones that we have today, um, right? So it's, it, it's challenging. What we are going to, you mean we are going to read a book from five, 500 years ago? Um, but this was his world. These were his references. This is where his knowledge came from. This, is, was, this was all his education, all the books he had read, this was his treasure trove. So here again, it is important to, to stop and explain these references to the students so they understand what Erasmus is talking about. So lots and lots in the praise of folly, lots and lots and lots, hundreds probably, of references to Greek stories, Greek mythology, <coughs> and so on. So this is what humanists did. They constantly referred to ancient authors. So in that respect, Erasmus was not different, say, than Shakespeare or Montaigne or Petrarch. In order to understand these authors, you need to be familiar with uh, the classics. Our students should be warned and made aware of that. Folly finds her arguments, her examples and illustrations in Greek mythology. She uses them to make her case or alludes to them, assuming that the readers are familiar with these stories or characters. So, Erasmus the humanist, and now Erasmus the Christian, very unhappy with the state of the church and the enemy of scholastic philosophy. Many pages of the praise of folly concern uh, scholastic philosophers and theologians. This also needs to be explained to the students. And it's something that um, uh, I'm realizing more and more I need to stop there and maybe teach, spend, I don't know, two or three days, maybe even more on scholastic philosophy, explain what was going on to the students because they, they've heard about it in their history class again, but maybe that was in the ninth grade. 
And so in the meantime, they've maybe not forgot everything, but um, a lot. And so again, I need to connect that and make them understand that this is a huge point. In fact, this is the most important thing in the praise of folly. So I don't want the students to miss that. So point number five, philosoph philosophy and theology, uh, scholasticism. Erasmus uh, studied ph uh, theology at the University of Paris, where he was further instructed in scholastic philosophy, for which he developed a strong dislike. The praise of folly indeed uh, deals with some fundamental developments in the history of the church that would eventually lead to the re reformation and the counter-reformation. So this is interesting for our students because they are Christians and uh, this is what this has to do with the history of Christianity. First we need to explain to our students what is scholasticism without necessarily going into too many details and of course it will depend on the class and on the year. Uh, some students may be really interested in that uh, and it's a really interesting subject so if I see that there is an interest, maybe we'll go, we'll go deeper into that. Scholasticism, so here is some of the things that I would say to them, was born between the 12th and the 13th century, when many Greek, Arabian, and uh, Jewish philosophical writings became available in Latin, uh, giving theologians new tools to approach, approach theology and the mysteries of the faith. This new teaching happened in the schools of theology of the emerging universities in Europe, such as Bologna in Italy, Oxford and Paris. This new thinking stimulated both theological and philosophical speculation. It is precisely this form of thinking that Erasmus criticized in the praise of folly. The works of Aristotle were the most influential. So again, here, here's an opportunity to talk about Aristotle. Um, and again, depending on the class, um, you may want to spend quite a bit of time on that because it's so important. Uh, the works of Aristotle was the, the most influential. His topics and analytics were now available in Latin and gave theologians new methods of disputation and science, which they adapted uh, adopted in, in their own techniques of discussion and inquiry. And of course, Thomas Aquinas uh, adapted the Aristot uh, Aristotelian notion of science to uh, theology, which became the science of sacred doctrine. So for all the theologians, Aristotle was the philosopher so it's important as the student realized that, the, the importance of Aristotle in medieval Europe the new writings, uh, entirely the product of the human mind, unassisted by revelation, showed the power of the human mind and offered a renewed scientific and philosophical conception of the universe. Yet, however exciting this was, for theologians arose the difficulty of reconciling the scientific revolutions with the teachings of the faith. So Aristotle, for example, taught that uh, the world was eternal. But how do you reconcile that then with the narrative of uh, the creation in the Bible? So could science become the servant of the faith? And the answer, of course, was yes, it could. And it did. Um, I have a quote here from the um, celebrated uh, French historian of med medieval philosophy, Etienne Gerson. Um, and I read it to you, it's a little bit long, not too long, but I think it's, it's worth reading. From one point of view, medieval speculation can be seen as a development of Greek philosophy, for the Christian philosophers used techniques inherited from the Greeks. Principles, methods of demonstration, and as often as not demonstrations themselves, were soon considered by Christians as their rightful property. Since their God was the truth of reason, as well as that of revelation, those early Christian converts felt entitled to the whole truth. For this reason, the new religion, instead of repudiating the Greek philosophical tradition, worked for centuries to keep it alive and to assimilate it as far as was possible. 
From another point of view, however, the philosophy of the Middle Ages implied a breaking away from the Greek tradition instead of uh, depending solely on rational knowledge, it called on the light of revelation to fortify and perfect the natural light of reason. The Christian philosophy of the Middle Ages is characterized by its recognition of this twofold source of knowledge and by its absolute trust in the fruitfulness of the cooperation of faith and reason. Indeed, med med medieval uh, thinkers trusted faith more than reason, but considered it inevitable for faith to make use of reason as it was profitable for reason to avail itself of all it could derive from revelation. So, end of quote. And then, um, so it, it is uh, St. Anselm of Canterbury who famously said, fides quaerens intellectum, it is faith seeking understanding. Or another one of his uh, famous quotes, Neque enim quaero intelligere ut credam, set credo ut intelligam. Right? So I, I, don't, um, uh, I don't seek to understand so that I may believe, but I, I believe so that I may understand. All these theologians ask the question, what can we know? In the 15th century, however, Nicholas of Cusa, whom I've already mentioned, concluded that it was better to recognize that some things were beyond human understanding and that the lesson that his contemporaries needed to learn was their own ignorance. The more learned a man is, the more he will appreciate how much he doesn't know. So that's the, uh, uh, the de docta ignorantia. This was his doctrine of learned ignorance. And there stood Erasmus with him. Point, point number six, and I'm just about done. The philosophy of Christ. So why did uh, Erasmus dislike scholasticism so much? And this, of course, is absolutely central in the praise of folly. For Erasmus, the scholastic philosophy was too dry, too rigid, too systematic. It relied on logic too heavily. It advocated a moralism that was too authoritarian. And it was filled with what Erasmus considered pretentious jargon. Now, I'm not saying that Erasmus didn't have a certain appreciation for, for some of these theologians. Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure he did. Uh, it's just the overall picture that, uh, that he disliked and just the importance that this had uh, taken. So this uh, uh, scholasticism was leading the church in a direction that Erasmus uh, didn't like, uh, considered wrong. The theologians uh, Erasmus criti criticized <coughs> practiced the letter of the law, but they ignored the spirit of the law. Erasmus wanted to go back to the sources of early Christianity. Um, Augustine, Ambrose, Jerome, and to the Holy Scriptures. Erasmus was interested in a simple religion, touching the people and in touch with the world. He rejected complicated theological arguments who did nothing to further the gospel. In his imitation of Christ, Christ Thomas Akempis already had written, and I quote, if only the lives of these men had been as admirable as their learning, their study and reading would have been to, to, good, uh, to good purpose. But how many in this world care little for the service of God and perish in their vain learning? And in the praise of folly, Erasmus wrote, such is the erudition, so he's writing about the theologians, such is the erudition and complexity they all display that I fancy the apostles themselves would need the help of another Holy Spirit if they were obliged to join issue on these topics with our new breed of the theologian. Can you imagine? The apostles could not understand the theologian, the theologians, unless they were given a new Holy Spirit. And yet, they are the ones to imitate. They are the ones who change the world. Erasmus was saying, we need new leaders. We need new methods in order to reform the church and society. He was impatient with such scholastic thinkers and insisted on a return to scripture 
as a basis for theological discussion. Quote, again, this is Erasmus, yet all the while, he's talking about the theologians, they are so happy in their self-satisfaction and self-congratulation, and so busy night and day with these enjoyable tomfooleries tum that they haven't even a spare moment in which to take a single look at the gospel or the letters of Paul. The philosophy we need is not the philosophy of the theologians, it is the philosophy of Christ, the philosophia Christi, argued Erasmus. And the wisdom we need is not the wisdom of the world, but the wisdom of God, which is foolishness to the world. And there was folly's greatest victory. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. And 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the proper of God. To finish, I will give one last quote from Thomas Akempis, who with whom Erasmus would have agreed. But because many are more eager to acquire much learning than to live well, they often go astray and bear little or no fruit. If only such people were as diligent in the uprooting of vices and the planting of virtues as they are in debating of, of problems, there wouldn't be so many evils and scandals among the people, nor such laxities in communities. At the day of judgment, we shall not be asked what we have read but what we have done, not how eloquently we have spoken, but how holily we have lived. So this is um, what I had to say um, on the subject, um, on um, how to teach this book. And I would welcome your questions, your comments, <coughs> your input. Um, if you have any ideas, if you've taught this book, um, do you have any suggestions? Um, Go ahead. Well done, thank you. Do you happen to touch on the fact of Erasmus's relationship with Thomas More and the fact that the title of the book, Encomium Mora, sure. which is actually Greek, is actually a pun sure. on Thomas More? Yeah. Do you happen to touch on that? I, I will mention it to the, to the students, yeah, when, um, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's important, sure. But, and, and that's something I, um, I want to pursue more um, I, um, without a no pun intended. Um, mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the relationship between these two, between these two men. Uh, I have a book at home about a biography of Thomas More that I haven't had the time to read yet. Uh, but yeah, they were great friends, and I want to explore that. Very mm -hmm. great friends. Absolutely. And was, um, Erasmus with King Henry before. Exactly. Henry had yeah. more executed. Exactly. Absolutely. Do, have any of you taught the praise of folly? Yeah, I taught it for the first time this year. Well, this year? Did everything you? Everything that I've taught this year, I taught for the first time this year. So. Okay. Um, yeah. I what did it. you think? Um, I really enjoyed it. It was actually my, it was also my first interaction with it, so I was kind of learning it as I was teaching it. One of the things that we ended up focusing on a lot was the kind of the subtle like tone shift yeah. from beginning to end where it does kind of, it starts out very joking and it was obvious to the students even even from the very beginning how funny it was, but how some of them started to notice as it goes on, as you get about halfway through. Yeah. It's, it's not that it stops being funny, but it seems a little more heated, yeah. a little more venomous, I guess. Uh, in, a, in an effective way, not in a... Mm -hmm. uh, and then towards the end, how it, there is this really... All Bible. And it's a, sudden, <laughs> it's a really sudden flip to, wait a minute, because at the beginning it's like, ha ha, you know, it's funny, we're supposed to value folly, ha ha ha, it's very funny in all the examples, but then you get to the end and the question <laughs> kind of becomes, wait, should we? Mm -hmm. Like what, the way that the world talks about folly. Mm -hmm. What is folly to the world? Like, like you brought up First Corinthians, which is also something that we read in this same class that I taught, Praise of Folly. It's my mm -hmm. 11th grade Bible class. 
Okay. And yeah. we also do First Corinthians, which we just started uh, this week. Mm -hmm. And so this concept comes up, right? First Corinthians is really all about Paul saying, you guys, you Corinthians, think that you're wise. You've lived in a culture that says what is wise, and I'm telling you that it's actually yeah. the opposite. And this is sort of what happens, but nobody in the class was really prepared for that ending, yeah. for that so, tone to, to flip, because we're all laughing about how ridiculous it is that we would praise folly, and then we go, wait a second. So we, we uh -huh. spent a lot of time like, okay, where does it feel like this starts to yeah. shift? But, but the, the, the interesting thing is that Erasmus, as, as a humanist, really enjoyed uh, um, you know, what, what the ancients were saying, and um, having a good time, and laughing, and enjoying yeah. a, a good joke, and all that. Right. You know, that's part of who he was. I mean, he was right. not this austere guy, right? I mean, um, and, and so that was part of his culture as well. So they, uh, I think what he is saying is that there's nothing wrong with that, as long, of course, as you keep it within limits and so on. But when it becomes really dangerous is, you know, with what the church was doing, according yeah. to him, the bad kings and princes and so on. Um, um, and, and then I asked my students, because um, um, it's, it's, a, it's a question that I often ask myself uh, in the past, do you, do you think Jesus enjoyed a good laugh? Do you think he was happy? Do you think he, he had a good sense of humor? Or do you think he never smiled? Right? Uh, uh, Erasmus makes us think about what does it mean to be a Christian um, and, um, uh, and so on. So it's a very interesting, uh, provocative uh, book and uh, thought. Um, but you, did your students enjoy it? And did you, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we had a good time. <coughs> and uh, we got to do a pretty cool program assignment, actually, since we just did this program class, but we got to do a speech and character, I had them do a oh, speech fine. and character as a, as like a, a, a vice, but it was like a, you know, minor vice. Okay. So, um, somebody did a really great one on uh, the praise of procrastination. Yeah, and how yeah. leaving everything <laughs> to the last minute means you get to have all the fun, for, and, and then it also motivates you to get it done, which was really... Yeah, that's awesome. So yeah. yeah, so they did a, they did a really good job of actually understanding the, the satirical mm -hmm. aspects of it. Yeah. So yeah. And we went through it and I think we we spent two weeks mm -hmm. on it in class probably. Okay. Yeah. Chris, Christine Norvell who who taught the class before I did, she had uh, uh, a sign here and she put it around her neck with we attached, right? And um so folly folly speaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. when we were reading the books, uh, right? Um, uh, so the students had them. Yeah, it was funny. It was yeah. uh, en enjoyable, you know. Yeah. Um, but thank you all for listening and, and for coming. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>